Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, I am, I'm Martin O'Reilly. Uh, I, I lead the Research Engineering Group at the Alan Turing Institute, um, and I'm joined by Federico Nani and Camilla Ankle smith two of our uh, senior research data scientists. Um, who lead our recruitment and equality, diversity and inclusion um, areas, uh, respectively. And we're going to talk a little bit about how the teams sort of grown and evolved at the Turing over the past six years and, and share some of the sort of lessons we've learned along the way on, on sort of how we organise ourselves. So the Turing is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI, and we sort of work with a range of universities around the country um, and also some other partners where we sort of take the research and, and sort of put it into practice. The research engineering groups are sort of central, sort of RSE research data science team. We're sort of 35 research software engineers and data scientists, and we collaborate with researchers across the institute's uh, sort of program of research. We don't have our own personal research agenda, but we do sort of like co-lead um, some, some projects, um, and we provide sort of wider non-project support for the institute, so research uh, sort of computing facilities. Uh, for us, it's the cloud, but also the national access to the national facilities. Um, uh, you know, training and general sort of software support. And we've got an established career pathway within the group uh, that's five levels from junior to principal. And we're always looking for opportunities to work with others. So we have a sort of placement scheme uh, and we also have a, a model for um, sort of funding uh, other RICs from other groups to come and, um, and work with us on some projects. So uh, here's a few examples of some of the projects we do. Um, we, we've sort of got some more information about some of them on our store out in the, in the sponsor hall. Um, and sort of this is how it started. You know, so back in autumn 2016, the Turing opened its doors and we had our first students, we had our first research fellows, and the research engineering group went from one to three. Um, we were very fortunate in several ways at the beginning. Uh, we didn't have some of the challenges that we hear, hear a lot at, at sort of conferences like this. We had four and a half posts funded from core right at the start, and, and critically, those were permanent from the beginning. Um, and the team started at the same time as the Institute um, and, and has grown and, and sort of developed alongside it. So that was a real positive because we've had the freedom to decide on our culture and our, our ways of working. And we've also had the option to, you know, the ability to influence those in the wider Institute. Um, but, you know, so the downside is we had to figure all that out. Um, <laughs> And we've had to tweak it several times over the years as, as us and the Institute have kind of matured. So this is how it's going. Uh, we're now 35, 24 of us are here. And we're continuously recruiting at the moment and we're aiming for a team size of 45. Um, so again, you know, come and see us in, 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 at our desk if you're, you're interested in joining us. And we've got people in the team with backgrounds in psychology, history, geography, health, biology, physics, engineering, even a couple of computer scientists. Um, and almost no one in the team was a research software engineer before they joined. So, um, and while most people happen to have a PhD, that's by no means a requirement, uh, and we'd really like to find a way of having more people without a PhD sort of apply to join, as well as more folks from industry. And as well as valuing a sort of diversity of academic or professional background, um, you know, we want to sort of be a team that represents the full diversity of the communities that we live and work in. And honestly, on, on, on most aspects of that, we're not, we're not doing so well. Um, you know, we've, on average, we're, we've been sort of bumbling around 30% sort of women in the team. Now, we've heard a few stats sort of this week uh, that, you know, in, research, in data science as a whole, that number's sort of somewhere between 25 and 33, maybe. Um, so, you know, it's easy to go, well, we're not doing so bad for the sector, but the population's 50-50. You know, we need to find a way to do better. And, and when we look at some other aspects, you know, like we, 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 we're based in Camden in London. It's an extremely diverse community. And to be blunt, the diversity outside the door is, is a lot greater than the diversity inside the door. And, and we have to find ways of doing better. And if, if anyone out there is sort of struggling with the same problem and has ideas, we'd love to sort of figure it out together. Um, this is sort of how the team's grown and our composition's changed over time. And Fede's going to talk a little bit about sort of how we manage that and, and, and sort of how our roles have evolved over time. Uh, but first, I'll highlight a few sort of key milestones and, and talk a little bit about how we've evolved and how we organize ourselves. So November 2016, the team goes from one to three. Um, four and a half uh, permanent roles initially approved and no sort of formal target to recover our costs. Life was wonderful for a short while. Um, then in sort of in the mid-2017, we get our first head of team, which was James Hethington, who, who, who came uh, to us from UCL. 
and up till then, James Geddes had been sort of like subbing as principal to, to, to kind of keep things going. And at that time, we also went from being an RSE only team to having research software engineers and data scientists. And, and the model was we had one head and a, and a principal for each of those sort of specialisms. Thanks. Um, and now we've got sort of more and we're sort of growing. We're probably going to be four, four principals by the end of the year. Um, we formalized our first operating model. We started recovering costs and we've evolved this model over time. Um, and we've sort of, a few of the key lessons we learned from it, a few things that have worked really well for us is having a single blended rate for the team, um, which has decoupled sort of cost recovery from people project allocation. It's made a very, it made an impossible task merely very difficult. Um, we explicitly recharge the institute internally for the research support work we do. So on paper, we always recover 100% of our costs, which really smooths things over when the institute wants you to do more things that aren't projects, but then but, you know your project recovery rate goes down. And something that we've learned recently, we've had the money to do for a while, but we're only really doing in actuality this year, is holding capacity in reserve for emerging priorities or that time when too many projects are funded, because um, you know, we find ourselves getting a bit slammed and oversubscribed all the time. Um, something else that we sort of learned to do over the years is delegate, um, sorry, uh, d delegate um, sort of ownership and responsibility to all levels of the team. So our seniors manage the team's primary relationships with each of our, our programs as, as this sort of challenge lead role uh, that we, we, we sort of um, evolved in 2018. Um, and you know, at any level, people in the team can lead uh, the service areas where we support the team in the Institute. And, and some good examples are you know, Fede and Camilla both took up their roles when they were standards. And I'm not sure if Ed's in the room, but he started the Turing podcast when he was a junior. Um, so I'm gonna pass on to Fede now to sort of talk a little bit about how we manage that growth. All right, hey everyone. So I'll give you a quick overview on basically how the team grew up like from being three people to up to 35, up to 45, hopefully, like during next year. Um, I don't know if you notice we are hiring and there's like a couple of flyers around. And I don't know, yeah, yeah please like share it around and things. So um, we've been doing uh, rolling recruitment for basically all 2018, all 2019 and and then from mid of 2021 onward and it means like we are like recruiting constantly with monthly interviews process and i was hired mid 2019 over there and then after a couple of weeks on a job i had the good or bad idea depends on the point of view of asking james get this if he needed some help with recruitment and he was like <laughs> well and then i got like all these like sudden new responsibilities and it's great like and it's it's a fantastic feeling of like you know having like like having influence on how the team uh, will evolve and like the possibility of like suggesting new ideas and everything but at the same time it's a constant and complex process to run so a couple of other highlights uh, one of them is as martin was saying we introduced the research data scientist role very early very early on and and as you can see most of the people that we are hiring as standard are data scientists they identify themselves as data scientists and this is very helpful also for bringing like a huge variety of discipline backgrounds into the team. Maybe that's because people like I, I come from a background in history and maybe it's easier to identify yourself as a data scientist while you are doing a postdoc in interdisciplinarity in interdisciplinary um, areas and things like that. Uh, we introduced the junior role in mid 2019 and we've done two cohorts for juniors and for all of them these are like this is the only non-permanent position that we have but for all juniors there there is basically a permanent position waiting for them uh, at the end of the two-year cycle um so we had two courts and and all the people in in the courts got promoted to standard and now we are opening uh, a junior position again in the group so if you know anyone that is interested any people finishing a master or after, you know, an intern in, in industry, that would be great for us. And so just like send them along. Uh, and Thomas in the group is opening now a new position for a research computing engineer. So if you're interested in that, Thomas, I think is in the room or he was in the, Thomas is definitely in the room. So I just chat with Thomas. Um, other important things, um, the role revolution. So we, here you can see a, an overview of the roles in a group and, and the, the current salaries. We are not competing with, with industry clearly, but we think that the salaries are competitive in, in the research and academic sector. Um, 
usually people enter in the group at either junior if they are after a, a master or, or after like a, an internship period or a, at standard level if they are after a few years of industry or maybe they've done some research like, like doing a PhD, for example, okay? Um, but we are very flexible in the group about the, the role that they cover. Like, so you can be a research data scientist or a research software engineer. You can change your title while you are part of the group. And there's basically, it's a spectrum, okay? So depending to the conference that you are going, you can present yourself as a data scientist or a software engineer, and we are very flexible with this. And especially, we are also very flexible in the way that you define what you do as part of the group and the way that you want to contribute to the group and the way that you want to shape your role as part of the team. Um, Another couple of important things. Um, these are feedbacks for both for people in the room that are leading a team and they are basically planning to do, for example, rolling recruitment, or people that are in a team and they are contributing to, um, to the recruitment process. Um, doing rolling recruitment is really challenging and it's really, really tough. So um, it has an impact on basically the time spent uh, on the team doing interviews. You never have the time to improve your process because every time you are at the end of the month and you are doing interviews, you are already checking the new application. So for us, it was <laughs> counterintuitive. It was very useful to have a break during the pandemic because finally we had some time to rethink about our process, address all the issues that we were seeing in the, in the process, prepare documentation so other people could run recruitment where I was you know, planning to go on holiday, for example, or on paternity leave like next year. So, you know, it's uh, focus on the internal documentation on, on the way that you want to run the process that you are planning and try to be as transparent as possible, both internally with your colleagues, because recruitment is a challenging thing and there are lots of gray areas. So you want to be cl uh, clear on the way that you are managing and also try to be as transparent as possible outside. We have one page for frequently asked questions that we always keep. Uh, improving for all the people that are considering applying and we try to give feedback to all the people that were unsuccessful at interviews to help them in case they want to be part of our community and they want to consider another position in RSC uh, to help them basically reaching that. So I'll pass it to Camilla for the final part of the talk now. Thank you, Fede. So, okay, I need to change the slide. So recruitment alone is is, is, is not enough, really, especially because uh, we are competing with people like Google and Facebook, which are not very far away even from our offices. So, so we also had to focus a lot on allowing people to feel that they're growing in the team and that they are that, that and that their skills are, are 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 developing, especially because we have a very diverse uh, set of skills. So not everyone is going to grow in the same way. So we have worked a lot in focusing in how in, in developing a competency framework that could somehow take into consideration how all of these different kinds of skills can grow and how you can, uh, uh, well, be promoted and also uh, uh, take more responsibilities on that. So something else happened in 2020 was that we decided that the senior role would be only be open internally. Uh, so allowing like the, the, the people in the standard roles to, to, to be promoted and to feel like they could grow within the team. We are thinking how to fix that also opening again to, to, to outside without uh, hurting people on the team because we also know that we senior uh, research software engineers maybe in other universities in London should have the opportunity to come and work with us if they want to and not have to be downgraded. So also well within in the last five years we have promoted 14 people from the junior to standard to senior to well, not the same person, right? But uh, up to director, like uh, Martin was promoted, I think a couple of years ago from, from principal to director. And, uh, and we do salary progression, so we try to, like, if you're performing as a specter, we try to move, uh, make sure that you, you move it in the bands. We have a cost of living increase, so this year we had a 5% of cost of living increase, which was good enough at the moment. Uh, well, we know what's going on, but... So, uh, so, so, so some of the things, like, uh, about cost of living increase or how we promote people are, like, kind of tricky subjects. And one of the things we want to do is to be very transparent of how we discuss and make these decisions. And so a lot of these are happening openly in, basically, GitHub issues that live in a cover board that is how we mention, uh, or how we m manage the team. So, so this can be very good in the sense of it feels very transparent. On the other hand, like, people are also faced about the uncertainty and see how long it can take to make a decision. 
uh, we also, as we mentioned already, we have these uh, service areas where people uh, uh, have the time to, 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 to allocate the time. In fact, it's not like they had to do extra work uh, outside of the working hours or outside of the project to like, help develop the team. And so well, that's one of the reasons there's three people talking in this presentation, really. Uh, and also we had these away days where people, we join together in a place and we kind of talk about how we want the team to look in the future. And we've been piloting initiatives for the touring. So we had, for example, uh, the, an EDI strategy before the touring had an EDI strategy. And we also start piloting things like remote working. So if we go to our timeline again, uh, well, we started having like flexible working with meant people will maybe work from home one day a week. And uh, then we all know what happened in 2020. So the tourney was closed for 18 months, the offices. And we all learned to work from home. And then when the tourney opened back again, a lot of people have moved out of London. Uh, so, so we had like, I don't know, a third of the team that doesn't live in London anymore. We also realized that if we were open to hire people that wouldn't move to London, we would increase the diversity of our hires as well. And so big part of the team at this point have been either hired and onboard during the peak of the pandemic. Uh, uh, so we also know that we all need social interaction and some people want to go to the office, so that kind of half of the team goes to the office regularly. But we, that, so, so we, we, it is a bit uh, dangerous uh, that then you cre create like two silo groups of people who like to go to the office or not. And so we've been trying to like focus on inclusivity and that, that, that working well remotely and or hybrid. And this is not easy, and I think we all are trying to learn how to do this at this point. And so uh, one of the things we do is like Fede has mentioned, documentation, documentation of like almost every single process that happens on the team, and also a synchronicity. So discussions happen on issues, it don't happen necessarily around the lunch table, and uh, so, so everyone gets, gets a say. So also, well, it is true that uh, we want to see each other every once in a while. So one of the things we did a couple of weeks ago was this hack week where everyone came back to London and we were trying to like do like a passion project. So this is the product of one of these things. It's called the Tyrex. So it's using like unity and reinforcement learning to teach a Tyrex how to walk. And I hope if I press this, it will do, ah, okay. So after the week, at the end of the week, the Tyrex was like a 10th model baby. So it kind of like stands and it just wasn't. But we'll keep working hard into like making it work. So f finally, we also, the touring has like a, 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 has a remit of training the next generation of, of RSCs and our, uh, research data scientists and the AI community. So we are working hard into helping the touring do this. So we've, we run formal research software engineering and data science courses. We uh, work, uh, try, trying to, to upskill our collaborators, like, like the PIs, the postdocs that work with us. We contribute to projects like the Turing Way. We have PhD uh, placements and fast stream placements as well. But we also would like to work with the rest of the RSC community into, into how we can do this better. And, uh, and, and yes. And we had a podcast. You should check out the podcast. It's quite good. And one of our team members is running it. So I think that's it. Uh, so if you haven't heard, we're hiring. We're hiring. Uh, and uh, if you want to talk about the, uh, the research computing engineering role, there is, there is Thomas somewhere. And if you want to talk about how to work together for me as a collaborator, there is Gabriel, I think, somewhere as well. And if you want to talk about training and how we can uh, well, connect better and train better uh, uh, the, the, the UK RSC community, there is James as well. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so recruitment isn't limited to, to the UK, but you, if you're, when we recruit within the UK, we don't mind where you live. Um, if you, if we recruit outside of the UK, so far to sponsor a visa, uh, if you don't have a, a right to work in the UK, we can sponsor a visa, but that means you have to come and live in the UK. We, we did look at, you know, someone commuting in from Brussels, it's no further than Newcastle, where we've got some people, but uh, we couldn't figure out the sort of how to effectively sponsor the visa there. Um, so the next one is, is role progression capped by numbers? Right, so sort of. Uh, so so uh, 
the every junior is really a, a standard in waiting. So, so, so if we have X approved posts, we reserve one post per junior that we've currently got through the training program. Um, at the moment, we have to our operating model requires us to keep the same mix, but um, we actually we're, we're not too bad in when it comes to sort of where the where the kind of branching point happens. So, we have r roughly the same number of juniors and standards as we do seniors and leads. Uh, so, so there's really a one-to-one -one relationship between kind of, you know, the, the kind of working seniors and the working standards. Um, and then we sort of like have a narrowing where there's sort of one principle to every three or four sort of seniors and leads. Uh, and then there's one of me. Uh, something that we're really looking to see if we, quite hard to see if we can do is to remove that cap as you go from standard to senior. Um, and, and be in a position where if everyone was around long enough and progressed well enough that, and we were all seniors and in a stable state, that would be okay. If that happened tomorrow, we would have to really, really up our charge out rate and that would be a bit scary. Um, but we're working quite hard to do the maths to see if we can support that because that would allow us to be a better member of the community and, and, and support people moving sideways at, you know, at, at senior levels. Um, and, and we really feel uh, like responsibility for that. But there's, and there's also value in having that fresh perspective and insight sort of coming in. Um, how effective has junior recruitment been? Um, so it's, I mean... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, thanks. OK. Yeah, just ask, change the speaker for a sec. Uh, so the, there were two questions actually connected. One is uh, how effective has junior recruitment been? And the other one was like whether we offer some form of training or something like that. And uh, so like, my experience joining the team, so I joined like right after a postdoc in digital humanities, and so I felt like a gigantic imposter syndrome arriving in Reg, um, yeah, like which well, I'm still dealing with it from time to time. It's getting better, but I think like the best thing in the team is that we run this um, research software engineering course like once a year, and I think it's a great opportunity for everyone joining the team to either be part and follow the course or support like the course as a helper because you get like an overview of how the team thinks about research software engineering and what it means actually and i think that was really useful especially also for our junior in the team to just like take part in that course follow up help where you can or just like take part in the classes uh, but in general I, I don't think it has been at all a, a time sink for the first year like people like contributed like highly effectively to projects it's very challenging to select juniors simply because you will we will be doing the um, going through the application in a month time and you receive a huge amount of great applications from people with just a little bit of experience so it's very hard to decide to give to who do you want to give opportunities to interview especially because we do everything internally so we have a maximum capacity in a month time to interview people uh, so that's the main challenge but i think we receive like amazing just amazing applications for people and yeah so just like a bit of internal training, and then that, that works out perfectly. Um, who wants to go with the next one? Yeah. Um, just on the direct question about uh, are, are juniors effective uh, and a net positive in year one? Yes. Um, so um, yeah, this, this is a challenge. So, so we explicitly can't compete with Google, Facebook, you know, anyone who's uh, near the finance, the folks who are doing that. We like to compete with the kind of broad middle, maybe all the organizations who have research soft, sorry, who have software engineers or data scientists, but they're not software engineering or data science consultancies. We're struggling to get good market information as to where we, where we are. When we first set our salary bands, you know, we thought we were roughly competitive with that. We stayed roughly the same place compared to, say, sort of, you know, academia in general, but we don't know kind of what's happened to that big middle, um, and we're trying to source some information for that. But talking to others around the conference, that seems to be quite hard to get hold of. Um, I think one of the things, but I do think we sort of punch above our weight, and I, and I suspect many of your groups do too. You know, there's, there's a, a sort of, people come to the group, they feel they've got, you know, more socially impactful work, they, that they feel they've got more interesting work, they feel they've got more control over the work they do, and to learn new things, they're not doing the same stuff all the time. And I think something that has worked well from you know, the way we run ourselves is they also feel they've got a lot of control and influence over the place that they work and, and they can make it somewhere that's fulfilling for them. And I think collectively all that sort of works. Now we've had people leave us and mostly people have gone on to things and not always to higher pay, um, but obviously you know, some have. Um, and yeah, this last, next one's a, a good question. What regrets do we have? Oh, Did yeah. someone want to, ha does someone have a regret? Well, I have, well, well, well. <laughs> 
I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 something like I don't know. Like okay, so that's that, that. This is like usually the first one that I think. So um, we had so after the pandemic, we did one single gigantic round of recruitment around which we spent months and months planning, and that was that was great. But after that, we decided to go back to do rolling recruitment simply because it was like simple to set it up and it's by basically a long running continuous project. And my, my usual regret there is that I know that when we spent so much time working on comms, we were able to attract a large and more diverse pool of applicants because we were very supportive with their application. We did like, you know, drop-in session where we were like chatting with people that were interested in applying or going to well during the pandemic online events to convince people to apply or being to a conference and so the only regret of like rolling recruitment is that we don't have the energy to keep this momentum going and it will have it, it has an impact and we know about that so in that sense it's like this difficult balance between how much you can do every month with something that should run without having too much impact on your team so yeah something like that um, and, and, and maybe not a regret but like something that I've really struggled with accepting is it's a quite a lot of work and it's quite slow to sort of work out everything as a team together um, and we put a bunch of things that were becoming quite important to us aside during the pandemic just because it was easier to we could unambiguously drop those things and, and take a bit of load off and I think it's meant over the last year we've been in a situation where you know, it's taken us the whole year to kind of sort out some things that really we wanted to have sorted out sort of early on in 2020. And, and I, you know, I think that's, you know, the combination of trying to do all these things at once and, and people sort of like having that uncertainty about, oh, well, how can I take my next step up? You know, because we've only made the lead role, we sort out, you know, sort of like whether we're going to have another principal and, th you know, and sort of what progression looks like. Uh, and, and so I think that's been sort of stretched and I, you know, I, we do sort of wonder whether there were, you know, could we have done things sort of better and, and um, uh, so, so yeah, we, we, we sort of worry about that. Um, is that about us? Oh, that's <laughs> so that's uh, our old boss, uh, my, you know, my, pre my predecessor James Hethington saying he, he, he regrets leaving. Um, but I mean, ARC sounds also like a nice place and you're recreating some of the, the good things, I think. Um, um, I'm happy to pick any other questions up in the, in, in the break. Um. Thank you. I'd like to thank our speakers from the ATI.